Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are, and welcome to um, another one of IPEX webinars. Um, and today we're going to be focusing on PD data analysis tools and techniques. So if you like, up to date, we've, we've focused a lot on how we detect PD, the types of systems that are available for cable, for switch gear, for different types of electrical assets, and how we've sort of collected that data. And now we're going to really look at some specific tools that are then used. So when, once you've got this data, some specific tools you may then use to um, delve a bit further into that uh, data and then maybe decide if you want to take action, what action should you take and how you sort of quantify, how you track, how you trend the PD uh, data and the PD levels. So as I mentioned, um, online partial discharge testing and monitoring, um, specifically looking at PD data analysis tools and techniques. What we're really looking at is monitoring systems and test equipment, be it the IPEC equipment or, or other type of equipment, different shapes and sizes from spot testing to permanent monitoring system. But what are the sort of tools and techniques that are inbuilt um, in these equipment often, or what, are, what tools and techniques are very useful in order to transition from that sort of first level detection to taking useful action on your assets. So there are many different ways that, that you can view and analyze PD data. But broadly, what I've done here now is I've split them into two categories. One is about the detection of PD, and one is about the interpretation and action of PD as well. But it is important that we must consider the limitation of the tools we have. So although I'm sort of covering a number of topics here, not all tools will have all the different functions. And so it's important to really understand the equipment you have. Maybe you need um, two or three different types of equipment to make a sort of nice asset management program and a nice process um, to make sure you can sort of follow through the steps to take to get useful action at the end of it, if you like. The first thing we're going to jump on to um, is differentiating PD from noise. So there are different ways that you can view and analyze PD data and, and PRPD um, and, and specifically um, analyze PD data in terms of differentiating PD from noise. And so the first one is PRPD, phase resolve partial discharge. PD has a pattern in the power cycle. Background noise often doesn't have a pattern in the power cycle. And so knowing and understanding some very simple tools and some rules rather of PD activity. Firstly, that PD has a pattern in the power cycle. It will be proportional to, to the phase as the energy in the power cycle increases, PD will be occurring. And secondly, that although PDs will occur as the energy in the power cycle increases, every time a PD occurs, it will change um, the defects point, change the, the, the point of where the PD occurs. So therefore, PD in itself is random in the power cycle, um, but it is it does have a pattern. So if we look at this one down here, and I shouldn't have put a complex PRPD in here, but this is there's actually two PDs in one power cycle. Um, but if we just look at this section here and then this section here, so that these first big pulses are on the on the rising edges of the positive, the rising edges of the negative. And this is a PRPD that's been um, collected over time. Uh, we can see a very distinctive pattern um, in this power cycle. So we can see that um, the PD is following that rule of occurring during the rising edges of the power cycle. And then we can also see that again, on this, this smaller PD here, which is actually shifted um, because that's on the next phase. Um, so one monitoring system is detecting two PDs there on two phases. So we can see this PD occurring on the rising edge, but we can also see that the PDs themselves are different levels, uh, different quantities, different magnitudes. And that, that is an inherent factor of the PD. So if you get any sort of very regular level of PD, then that's, that's not typically PD data. On the top here, we can see some very clear noise. This is actually the output of our um, instrument, but we can see very clear noise. So the bottom is from our monitoring system. The top here is from our instrumentation. We can see there's no pattern. And indeed, we can see these three big pulses, evenly spaced apart, very regular. That can't be PD, because if it was PD, it would be occurring, as we said, um, twice per phase in line with the power cycle and not occurring very consistently in this case. The other way we can do it then is wave shape analysis. So what we mean by that is looking at the individual PD pulse. Now PDs are, are very high frequency signals. So we need a very high resolution equipment to do that. With that, you're looking at more with, with monitoring systems that can do that. So on the right hand side here is a PD wave shape uh, from our monitoring system. So to put it into perspective, on the left here is one power cycle. So that's 20 milliseconds. 
And on the right here is one, what we call a, a segment, um, which is 20 microseconds. So that's 1,000 times smaller uh, than the PRPD here. And we look at a single PD pulse that's occurring. And with wave shape analysis, and I'll, I'll come on a little bit more in our categorization about different things we can do with wave shape analysis. But wave shape analysis, PDs have typical wave shape patterns. And noise obviously has um, some patterns as well, which can be inconsistent with PD. So what we can do is we can use the wave shape. We can look at the wave shape as a second level verification that it's a real PD and not a background noise. This is the perfect example of a cable PD. But of course, there is some there is some more sort of complex uh, characteristics, which I'll touch on in a moment. Audio, it's, particularly when it comes to surface tracking activity, um, it's very common to use headphones and use audio. So although ultrasonic devices, for example, which may be used to detect PD, they may detect a lot of background noise. But by using the audible output of these devices, um, you're able to, to hear and listen to the sound. That's a typical PD pattern compared to background noise. So that does take a little bit of training, of course, as you'd expect, um, but there is some very distinctive patterns and you usually very quickly can pick up uh, whether something's coming from a background noise source or something's coming from a PD as well. Then finally, some systems automatically differentiate PD and noise. So the first thing is you, you really want to have this data available regardless, um, but a lot of systems like the IPEC permanent monitoring system and even the portable equipment already has an automatic PD and noise differentiation inside um, so that it, it conducts that first uh, technique of PD and noise differentiation on your behalf, but then it does also display the data as well so you can see it. So if you're detecting raw data, analysis of these tools and techniques is noise and PD is very useful, um, but when it comes to permanent monitoring systems and, and more advanced PD equipment, quite often they do that PD and noise separation themselves. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna look at is trending of data. Assuming we can get rid of the noise, we can now measure the PD. And when we're measuring the real PD activity, once we're measuring that, what we want to do most likely is we want to trend that data over time. Now, trending of PD activity is very critical. And the reason is that PD can vary. It can vary daily, uh, yearly, and obviously as the asset degrades or the PD progresses in its life. So just doing a single measurement point of PD is relatively useless and it's much more useful to test for a PD and then come back and test in future. Or of course, if you've got a permanent monitoring system, then your testing will be continuous. Changes in PD has an impact on different sort of uh, characteristics of PD. So it's not useful, therefore, to only measure the PD level, for example, the magnitude of a PD. It's also useful to measure the PD count, which is the number of PDs per power cycle. Because as a PD changes, the, the level and the count can be affected in different ways. Let's not forget, we're looking at a, a unique defect point in insulation. And every time a PD occurs, that can change. And how that defect will progress depends on the material that we're looking at, depends on the defect type, depends on the, the load and temperature variations of the asset, depends upon the manufacturing type and, and all, this, all these sort of aspects. And so how a PD progresses over time really varies depending upon factors that are outside of our control, factors that we won't know. And so we get a change of, of PD level count and energy, uh, maybe in different aspects. So if we look on the right hand side here, then here's an example that I picked out of. So this is data from our permanent monitoring system. And what I've done is I've picked out two examples, looking at how the PD sort of changes over time. So in example one, this top chart here is the PD magnitude measured in picocoulomb. So magnitude or the PD level. And each data point is when our monitoring system has recorded the data. And this in, in this time scale, it's over a, a two week period uh, for the purposes of, of this one. So we can see that the level remains relatively low up until this point, and then the level suddenly increases. And now we get a higher level of PD activity. So the energy in every individual PD activity is significantly increased. If we look at the chart below it, this is the count chart. So this is the number of PDs per power cycle. And we can see on the count chart, this has remained very, very consistent. So the number of PDs occurring per power cycle hasn't really changed. So even as the PD energy increased, so individual PDs became maybe twice as energetic, the count has remained the same. On the right hand side here, we have the opposite occurring. This is over a longer time scale in this case, but as the magnitude of the individual PDs has remained 
relatively consistent. The count, the number of PDs per power cycle was very low until this point, and then suddenly the count increased to very high. So the overall energy output in both of these situations has increased, but one is caused by individual PDs remaining the same um, number per power cycle, but the energy of them increasing. And the other one is that the energy has remained the same, but the number of them has increased. So that's why it's important to trend data on different variables, not just look at the PD level, not just look at the PD count, and equally not just look at the overall energy. It's important to understand what's happening at a deeper level. And then of course, at the bottom chart here is the raw data. It's also important to plot raw data um, over time as well. Very useful to understand what that sort of background level of noise is, just to make sure, just as a double check to make sure that you, um, that you understand how the PD is relative to the background noise, which is helpful when it comes to any sort of further investigation uh, that you might be conducting on site as well. So PD levels, just as a, just as a, a, a side note, obviously count is, is a number, PD level, there is some sort of standards. So cable PD and GIS PD is often measured in, in coulombs, typically nano coulombs or pico coulombs. Switchgear PD is often in decibel. So let's not forget a decibel is, is a unitless logarithmic scale. And so for PD detected with TEV, we use dB MV, so that's dB millivolts. So we translate the millivolt value into dB. And for the ultrasonic, we measure in microvolts and we translate that to dB. So that's sort of an industry standard that's across the board, uh, not just IPEC, but it's typical units that are used to measure the different PD level. So just, just to bear in mind, when you're looking at the level changes, in this case, this is a cable PD. So this is in picocoulombs. If it goes from five to 10, it's obviously doubling. But it's important to understand that dB is a logarithmic scale. So the changes from 10 to 20 dB is very different from the changes from 20 to 30 dB, for example. Um, then finally, on that first detection, so it's great that we can now detect PD. And second level, we can now trend it over time. But then maybe we're monitoring hundreds and hundreds of assets. So, I mean, IPEX permanent monitoring system, for example, we've installed them around the world. Um, or even if you look at a particular network, it's probably more applicable. So uh, London, for example, we have about 80 permanent monitoring systems installed around London. There's over 3,000 assets, I think, on the on the network. So it's impossible as a user to go into each asset and look at the trends of data because that would just take up too much time, too much resource. So it's important above that to build a mechanism or a method to, to if you like, rank the severity of our uh, PD data. So the way we do this is with um, criticality. So criticality is an index of asset condition and the likelihood of failure. And it combines a number of sort of variables. The main aim of this is to basically combine different factors and very quickly as a user, be able to look at all the different assets you're monitoring and identify where to target your resource, where to target your action and your next step. So IPEX criticality, is a score between zero and 100. It takes into account all the different variables I just mentioned in the trending. So the energy of the PD, the count of the PD, the level or the magnitude of the PD. Importantly, it also takes into account the trends of activity. So one thing about PD and, and when it comes to permanent monitoring or even spot testing, this is why trends of PD activity is very critical and very important. Online PD, we don't know where the PD activity is. The very nature of online PD means it can, it's an uncalibrated measurement. So you may get a PD that appears very high, but it may be very consistent. Um, and you may get another PD that appears very low, but that PD is increasing. And so IPEX system would automatically put a higher criticality on that smaller PD that's increasing rather than that large PD that's remained consistent over time. And the reason is until we know the location of that activity, we don't know which one is more severe than the other. And obviously this lower PD is on a trend to failure. It's increasing rapidly. And maybe this would, this would increase to a high voltage failure. It's important to understand energy and count of activity, but also to understand the trend and the change in PD activity as well. They're two, the two critical aspects to understand the severity of your measurement. 
To understand severity of PD, it's not enough only to understand the specific, uh, the measurement time, energy, and count. That's not enough. You need to understand the change of PD. How is it changing? What's the trend doing? And so with IPEX system, we monitor criticality over a two week period. We take a two week data period to monitor the criticality, but obviously all of our monitoring system and test equipment monitors trend over a long period of time. So as a user, you can see how the trend's changing, but for alerts and alarms, um, it's over a two week period. Then what it means is, as you can see on this website here, you can very quickly see where the problems lie um, on, your, on your chart, on your graph. 